Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome back to our research seminar series, Global Agenda in the Arts Management Research, Interrogating, Redefining, and Challenging Traditional Research Canons. So the whole series is designed to bring to you the excitement of different research projects that are happening here in Singapore. So we are going for a scope. That's why for each panel, we have three persons talking about their research projects. Today, uh, we brought <laughs> National Heritage Board colleagues to our seminar to tell us more about the National Heritage Board research agenda and research grants that I hope each of uh, you will consider to apply one day with an amazing research project that you have in mind. So we have also an amazing panel of our colleagues, academic colleagues, joining us from National University of Singapore and Nayan Technological University. So these are professors Mazna Mohammed, uh, Kok Henry, and Gina Tay. So let me now introduce our wonderful moderator and then the keynote speaker. And then we will just start this exciting event. So our moderator today is Sunita Janamohanan. She has worked in the arts since 1999 with a portfolio that covers a range of art forms and creative industries. And she has been an arts manager, curator, producer, venue manager, and heritage manager in Kuala Lumpur and Penang in Malaysia. She has been a member of the Heritage Advisory Panel for the National Heritage Board of Singapore since 2018, serving on a subcommittee for intangible cultural heritage. And of course, she is our valuable colleague in the program teaching arts management. So, um, and let me right now to introduce their wonderful keynote speaker that we have today, uh, Mr. Yo Kirk Xiang. He is the senior director of the Heritage Pol Pol <coughs> Policy at the National Heritage Board. He oversees various aspects of uh, National Heritage Board work, including the research, documentation, and commemoration of Singapore's built heritage and national monuments, archaeology, and intangible cultural heritage. He is currently a member of the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage Evaluation Body, a board member of the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts, and is involved in other advisory panels and committees in various government agencies. Prior to joining the National Heritage Board, uh, he worked at the Ministry of National Development and was responsible for developing policy policies and strategies related to the built environment and sustainable development. So we are very happy to have you with us today. Thank you for coming and the floor is yours right now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to share about uh, NHB and our work in the area of research. Uh, I'm Kirk Siang. Uh, I've been working at NHB for a while, um, but maybe just to share what NHB is all about. Uh, we are the agency, government agency that looks at uh, heritage issues and when we talk about heritage it's quite wide in the sense that we look at museums, the collections, but also the historic buildings, what we term as intangible cultural heritage, archaeology and many other areas. Um, our work is to preserve and celebrate our heritage and we do this through many means. Research is one of them and we want to promote a greater cultural understanding and also using heritage and culture as a way to bring people together, to bridge divides, to encourage more greater uh, cultural understanding among uh, diverse communities. So about the topic of research, research is actually a very core part of NHB's work because research um, kind of advises us and provides the foundation of much of the work that we do, whether it's staging an exhibition, or deciding on whether a building should be preserved or conserved for the future, uh, or working with communities and uncovering their stories. These are all very important aspects. And although I think we've been hard at work in this area of heritage for many years, including our partners, um, actually there's still a lot, a lot more that we are waiting to be discovered about Singapore's heritage, about the stories of people. And I think you'll be hearing from our various speakers later when we sh they share about the research projects that they've done. Um, literally, we sometimes have to dig into the layers of history, like the picture here shows. 
uh, research into like different areas, including archaeology. They can help inform us of our, our nation's history that dates back to 700 years ago. But today, we are still uncovering many of these things, um, you know, the, the artifacts, the motifs that tell the history of the people, uh, the cultural influences around the region as well. And more importantly, I think at NHB, we want to find ways to encourage a community of practice, a community that um, can support the research and to grow uh, research and uh, understanding and capabilities in this area as well. So a bit more about our research agenda. Uh, firstly, this year we have launched the Singapore Heritage Plan 2.0, as we call it. The first version was uh, dated back to 2018 to 2022. And the second edition uh, is from this year, 2023. Uh, that will help advise and guide our work uh, over the five years, lasting until 2027. Um, in terms of the areas of the Heritage Plan 2, uh, we have identified four areas, which is uh, heritage identity, how heritage is an important part in telling the identity of people as a nation, but also people as a community, as a group. Um, communities are important as they partner, they are important partners that we work with to celebrate our heritage. Industry is one area that we've also identified. Industry is quite wide. It could be heritage businesses. They have very long histories. They provide uh, goods and services, uh, but uh, are also a cultural offering. They bring about, uh, contribute to uh, pre historic precincts identities as well. As well as innovation, I think we are living in the digital age with AI, uh, with many digital platforms, social media. So we also want to look at how uh, innovation and innovative way means technologies can support our research findings, can support our work in this area of heritage. Um, there are also emerging areas of interest for us, areas of sustainability given the current focus on climate change, the effects. I think we're all really feeling the effects um, of uh, climate change and heritage issues. Uh, uh, although we sometimes think of them as the past, but they're also important in advising on us on contemporary issues. Another area that we have been exploring is the area of well-being. Uh, we've been looking at best practices in well-being and heritage, how museums or, or museum programs can contribute to uh, effects of well-being. Um, for example, bring people together, combating social isolation, uh, addressing mental health, uh, well-being aspects. So these are emerging areas of research that we are also at NHB quite keen to focus on in the next few years. A bit about the Heritage Research Grant that we give out. Um, it's a grant given out to uh, support academic research uh, in various areas of heritage. Uh, and these can range from maritime heritage, our maritime trade connections to the region, heritage well-being, as I mentioned, heritage businesses, which I mentioned as well. Uh, community history, heritage, just importantly, is also the sharing uh, and research finding as well. How we want to help encourage a greater and more vibrant uh, ecosystem of research by encouraging our researchers, by encouraging the institutions to find ways, means to share about the, their research findings to encourage greater awareness. And this uh, platform today is just my example of how uh, we use uh, research as a means to share the Singapore story. I just want to give a very uh, quick um, two examples of uh, research projects that we have supported in the past. Uh, this example is about the research to map the female uh, the Chinese female temples as sites of regional uh, social cultural linkage. So this uh, is a project by NUS and their research outcomes included publications and they also created a database of the photos and maps showing the different tombs and also the different places that are linked to the Chinese female temples. Uh, some of the, the fem in, in short, these female temples were temples that were very important to supporting uh, female the community in the past, uh, many of them uh, choose to live communally. Uh, they were unmarried, but they, they have a communal uh, living and lifestyle. Uh, but these were kind of uh, of the past, but it's also important in, in telling the stories of uh, this uh, unique group of females that contributed to our society in the past. Uh, the heritage is not only just looking at the past, but how the past can inform uh, 
um, the present as well. So during the COVID pandemic, um, there was a very interesting project uh, by the Sosui Hawk um, School of Public Health uh, by Dr. Li Ziyang, um, Li, Li, Li I think, uh, and um, researcher Lo Ka Singh. So they, 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 uh, they work on uh, research on the pandemics of the past and how the pandemics and the trends in the past history could also have relations, or also advise us in terms of uh, you know, trends or health issues. Uh, they are very contemporary, of course, that time was COVID-19. And their research also included articles, uh, public talks. And also, interestingly, this uh, uh, research went to a, uh, inform a graphic novel. Um, the cover is shown here. Uh, collaboration with Sunny Liu uh, called The Pandemic Cookbook to show the graphic. Sorry? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> to show the, the, the side of um, you know, interesting uh, snippets of life as we knew it, uh, familiar sites during the, the pandemic, people wearing masks, the delivery, um, Zoom meetings and all that, uh, things that we really hope we don't see again. <laughs> but it was a very interesting take on uh, how research and contemporary issues uh, can cross paths. Uh, with that, uh, uh, end my presentation. Uh, I, I want to reserve more time to have the dialogue and questions with you, and also time for our other speakers as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kirk Xiang. Um, so, hello, I am the moderator for today. So I'm going to very quickly introduce our panelists. Um, in the interest of time, their full bios are on the website, they're in the program, so I'm not going to go into detail. So very briefly, uh, we have Associate Professor Masna Mohammad, Head of the Department of Malay Studies at NUS, whose current research is gender, sexuality, and Islam in the Malay world. She was the principal investigator for a research project on being and becoming female in the Malay world, interrogating and curating the photo archives of early Singapore, which is the project that she'll be sharing today. Um, Dr. Ko King Wee is an assistant professor in the history program at Nanyang Technological University, and he was the principal investigator in a heritage and historical documentation project on the Nine Emperor Gods Festival in Singapore. The website is still up for this. You can check it out. Um, it's quite simply nineemperorgodsproject.com. Um, and he's also been the principal investigator in another project on archipelago heritage communities in Singapore. And then our last speaker is Dr. Gina Tay. She's a senior lecturer in the Department of Communications and New Media at NUS and researches in the areas of Asian television, fashion media, and cities and national identities. She'll be sharing with us today her research project titled Fashion Shows and Fashion Media, Documenting Singapore Fashion Heritage. The website for this is also still up, um, sgfashionhistories.net. Um, so they'll all be speaking about research projects that they conducted with the assistance of the NHP Research Grant. So, uh, Professor Masna, can I invite you? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Sunita and Natalia. And thank you all of, all of you for coming here. Uh, sorry that I don't have any uh, PowerPoint slides because I know that you're used to these visual things because you know we're given like five minutes uh, to speak. So okay, so what I'm going to do here is just uh, to just take off from Mr. Yo's uh, presentation just now about heritage research. And I understand that uh, some of you may be interested in doing research. So I, I'll tell you the, uh, about the project that uh, I did, uh, which was uh, given the grant by NHP. Now, it's, it's, uh, it's titled Being and Becoming Female in the Malay World. And so my uh, source uh, for this research uh, was photographs, you know, collections of photographs. I, uh, so what, what was the purpose? Well, the purpose was really to interrogate how uh, the idea of becoming uh, female or women or feminine uh, evolved over time. So, so the assumption is here is that you know there's this evolution, you see, of uh, ways of being. Okay, so so we use photographs. Now, why photographs? I mean, you would say you know, photograph is something that you can just watch in one frame and nothing more. But I must tell you that photographs. I mean, by now there are millions and trillions of photographs, right, all over the world. Not 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 counting the ones that you have uh, on your phone. But what we did was to look at uh, photographs at the turn of the century, uh, early 20th century uh, photographs. So, as you know, the technology was very different at that time, not like uh, what you have now. 
and and so we wanted to uh, kind of uh, see see whether photographs uh, can tell stories, and actually they did. So we uh, the first brief was to just uh, scout uh, photographs of uh, women, uh, Malay, because we wanted to kind of uh, and, and and the idea of Malay work was very. Uh, why not just uh, Malay as we think of uh, today see, as categories? So in the Malay world, so which meant that you, we we would be capturing uh, all kinds of people who came to this part of the world and who kind of represented a sort of Malayness. So one of the things I suppose in your mind would be like the Pranakan, you know, families. Yes, so they were also included, uh, and not just Chinese Pranakan, but also uh, Pranakan you know, from various other parts of Asia. Okay, how do you read uh, photographs? Because it's not like you, you can go uh, and interview people. All the people are dead, okay? The ones are in the photograph. I'm sure of that, right? Because uh, the photographs were like from the 1900s is it, to the 1930s. Okay, um, you will, you're taking for granted now with all the photographs you're, you're, that you're taking in your daily life. But with these photographs, what you do is that uh, we, we use a method called the close reading. So it's a method that people use for literature, actually, uh, where you actually study the text. So instead of studying the text, you study the images. Now, do you just look at the subject? So there's, there'll be a picture of a woman there. No, you go beyond that. You look not just at the subject, but you look at what's around, see, the picture. And a, a majority of the pictures, uh, at least before the 1920s, were taken in photographic studios. So of course, they were all kind of uh, posed and and composed maybe by the photographer. So you look at the props, you look at the expression of the person or the subject uh, in the photograph. You look at the uh, textiles, you look at the fashion, you look at um, uh, who are in the photographs. So, you know, surprisingly, uh, even just on one photograph, you can actually write a lot and, and you corroborate, corroborate all this with historical uh, data. So for example, um, the lot of photographs of, uh, I mean, the lot of examples, but I'm just giving you a very, just a very simple example. So there was a photograph of, uh, uh, one minute. <laughs> so okay, that I, I knew that, you know. No, so, so uh, very quickly, photograph of a Malay woman in uh, London, a uh, Wembley at that time. She was the only one. She, she was actually the concert of this uh, Malay Sultan at that time. And she was smiling. Uh, and there were all these men, you see, around her. So we were sort of curious to find out who she was. And uh, because none of the photographs of the women, if you notice, if you care to look at the early photograph, would have women uh, smiling. But she was smiling. So we, we dug up into the history of this woman. She happened to be not like the, f uh, 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 the first wife of the Sultan. She was actually one of the many wives. But yeah, she was a commoner. And, and actually, she and the Sultan were very Anglophile, you see. So they would like do things that no Malay woman would do at that time. They would go and attend uh, polo matches. She even owns uh, race horses. She would go to operas. So all those came out from the other side of the research. So you build a picture, see, of what becoming female uh, was like in those days. So I will just uh, wrap up just to tell you that do not take any photograph for granted. And if you care uh, to look at them, you will find that they are a very valuable uh, source of primary data for heritage uh, research. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mazna. Um, can we? Can I? Thank you very much, uh, Natalia and Sumita, for the invitation to speak here. And thank you to Kirk Siang and John from NHP for supporting our grant, uh, supporting our research project. So, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, to, well, I'll, I'll try to share a bit about what our project was about. So, uh, as uh, Sunita mentioned, we did a project on the Nine Emperor Gods Festival, which is coming up soon, uh, around mid October. So, if you, if you are interested, you can. Uh, well, if, well, I can tell you how I can tell really if uh, yeah I can share with Sunita and Natalia how you can go and have a look. Uh, so we this the project began uh, initially as a so we I was discussing with some colleagues and some uh, 
graduate students, uh, and we, we, we were thinking of, I was actually hesitating between a project on a religious festival, which I, uh, which actually sounded quite challenging at the time, and then a, a more traditional business history project, but something in me kept telling me that, yeah, maybe the religious festival one was uh, more appropriate, uh, more interesting. So the idea of the project, we, we framed it not only as a research and documentation project, we wanted to let uh, students in the tertiary institutions. So beginning with NTU, but also involving N NUS, and uh, we had students from NAFA and uh, Nian Poly, right, who, who also joined the project. The, the key thing was to not only document the festival, but also to get uh, young students from tertiary institutions to be involved, to engage. Because in teaching at NTU, uh, after about, I was only at that time maybe two years in NTU, uh, I realized that many of our students had no chance to interact with such cultures, such environments. Even if they walk past the temple, they don't dare to walk in, right? So that's what we uh, did. And we, we decided to be a little bit more ambitious. We tried to cover 15 temples. Uh, so in the end, our project involved about over 100 students. Uh, because all this, takes, all this took place during the term, term semester time, right? So we, always had to work out their schedules, right? Because we cannot wait for the festival. The festival will not wait for us. <laughs> and we needed to get students, so we needed to have rotating shifts and all that. So that was one of the major challenges. Another major challenge was that uh, many of our students don't speak dialects. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's another challenge. Uh, but luckily, most of the temples, uh, they do Mandarin. They, they, the people talk, and they are able to speak and converse in Mandarin. The other key question, challenge was that uh, the Nine Purpose Festival has very strict rules on purity. So our students all had to go on vegetarian diets three days before the festival, and the festival lasts for 10 days, right? Uh, so we are, we are we're talking about a project that requires students to go on half a month of vegetarian, uh, wear all white during the festival. I told them, I make you the t-shirt, the rest you buy yourself. I can tell you where the sales are, but I can't get you your shoes and pants. <coughs> but everywhere else, but we got to just wear as what they wear at the temple. And also, uh, we required them to be like, respectful at the temple uh, to, towards uh, the deities. And, uh, even if they are, no matter what religion they are from. Uh, and our project attra attracted students from all religious backgrounds. We had, we had Christians, we had Muslims, we had Hindus. Uh, the, yeah, but the other challenge is that because of the requirements for purity, right? Many of the uh, festival sites, uh, certain core areas for rituals, they only allow males in. But our project was like 75, 70 percent female. <laughs> I don't know why. We seem to we seem to have attracted more female still, uh, participants uh, in in our project. So that was another major challenge. But and another thing was, of course, we had a two year cycle right to do the project. But you normally need at least a few months to to gain rapport, right? So many, we spent like three months trying even to en trying to enter a temple, right, to, to start talking to them. Because Nine of God's temples are famous for being, like nothing happening at all for the whole year until the, well, like this month, then things liven up, you start to find people coming to the temple on a, a more, uh, on a continuous basis. So there was a lot of uh, coordinating, because it was 15 sites, uh, temples all over, uh, I mean, uh, temples all over Singapore, right? but uh, we manage over time, right, to, to sort of, uh, to, to finish the project. Uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, required a lot, I mean, it required a lot of uh, persistence, right? And one of the key things is that, uh, one of the key takeaways from doing such field projects is that we often have to just show up. So we tell our students, I mean, you can, I mean, you can be afraid of this, afraid of that, you can have doubts, but the key thing is to just show up and well be sincere and people will talk to you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, King Wee. It's all right, you can just leave that there. And our final speaker, Gina, please.
thank you um, to Lassell for inviting us and organizing this seminar. It's really nice to be in this space to interact with students. Um, so just wanted to share a bit about my project. Um, it came up as a collaborative project. right? So I actually, this was something that I worked on for my PhD many years ago um, around fashion journalism. And then after that, I moved on. Um, but then I had two collaborators who wanted to, you know, apply for this grant, and they said, "Oh, we haven't been successful in the past. <laughs> so could you come and could you lead us and be the PI in this?" So I said, "Yeah, sure." You know, um, so we combined some of our ideas, and so fashion media really is uh, what I usually focus on. So um, we're really keen in this project to look at quite a, a big period of time, from 1950 to 1999. So it's actually quite, quite ambitious. It also coincided during the COVID period. So it meant that some of the physical archives were actually closed for most of the time that we actually had this um, grant. Okay, so we had to work our way around it. So uh, apologies for the <laughs> full on text, right? So I just wanted to put it there anyway. So, you know, if anyone is interested after that, you can always approach, yeah, to, for the text, okay? So um, a couple of, Things. So this is our website, right? So fashion, uh, Singapore fashion histories. Um, just have a couple of, so what what is this project about, right? We wanted to look at um, fashion as a site of national identity consumption, right? So all of us kind of understand, I think, in Singapore, the importance of fashion. Singaporeans love fashion, um, and from the earliest time, right? A lot of the <laughs> pictures we actually see. Right, uh, from 1950s to 60s, lots of really beautiful pictures right, around women who have, you know, been taken up with the aspiration of the wares, and no, very much copying kind of dual cuts and everything like that. And a lot of the early photographs. Okay, so, so the idea was to kind of look at these different sites of fashion consumption. Right, one of which was fashion media. Fashion media is really important because I think in something as ephemeral as fashion, right? Uh, one day it's there, next day it's gone. Sometimes you wear things even for just you know like half half a day or something, right? So, um, but the idea is that fashion sites is kind of uh, multi-sided. So we could look at fashion shows as one of the sites. We could also look at fashion me uh, fashion media as one of the sites, right? So we really wanted to look at two other sites, right? fashion production. So there's a lot of people who, actually a huge fashion uh, industry at that time around manufacturing, people who were doing tailoring, people who were going into etiquette and all the rest of it. Okay, But this part of the project only focused on fashion shows and fashion media. Right? So um, it was quite extensive and in the end what we decided to focus on due to some of the limitations right, and also looking at the fact that quite a lot of people have started looking at um, fashion magazines. Um, we decided to focus on fashion journalism, right? So looking at um, mainstream newspapers, right? So in that time, that period was Singapore Free Press and Straits Times, right? And these two um, papers, mainstream papers, uh, what we kind of, what I kind of wanted to push for was to really look at the way in which ordinary Singaporeans um, constructed themselves, right? So how did they think about fashion? How was fashion part of their everyday engagement? So for example, in the 60s, there was a clear mandate uh, from you know the government to try and get women to go out to work, right? And so the articles, a lot of the commentaries, the editorials were very strong about how do you wear, how do you put yourself together, right? How do you change from your Chinese some um, foods, right? Uh, from your Malay baju kurongs to office wear, right? So there's like, you know, uh, what type of skirts you wear, what sort of, you know, strategies that you might actually take, right? To become a modern citizen, right? And then when we, we move into 70s, we actually begin to see how, you know, um, a lot of these sorts of editorial completely died out in the mainstream press, right? Because in that time, um, fashion was very much concentrated around industries, right? Around manufacturing, around sites of trade. Then we begin to see lots of kind of trades and stories around trades with Australia and Japan, right? So um, we found all these in the National Archives. So the idea was to construct a database, right? That we could then, a, a huge fashion database that we could share with all the other fashion researchers in Singapore. 
right? So it's a kind of pioneering work. It's it's nascent in that sense. Um, but what do we do with the actual database, right? So there's always this question. So what we did was we actually, um, one of my primary um, team member was actually working in La Salle, and she actually recruited some of your colleagues, some of your classmates, right, to write some of these stories. So we had students from La Salle, we had students from NUS who took the database and wrote stories from it, okay? So uh, this is just pictures from the day, so you can see that, right? Uh, so sartorial mapping of Singapore's fashion districts, right? Where were some of the, you know, uh, where were the fashionable parts of Singapore in that time, right? Um, or the rise of where did Japanese fashion become big in Singapore, right? Uh, Singapore's Parisian dreams, right? How Singapore often had the aspirational, even from the late 50s, right? The, the you know, people were traveling and doing that. Um, some of our writers were really amazing. They would actually go for the, you know, the, the fashion shows and I'd write about it. So another category that we were um, really interested in were the voices of Singapore fashion. So who were all these very integral people, right? So we wanted to actually do more of the oral archives, but to be honest, we found out that a lot of the list, of, we had a list of about 20 people. Um, some of them had passed away. Some of them had um, left the country. We couldn't locate them, right? But we managed to get three, three of the key um, people here, right? So we managed to get Pat Crawl, Brendan Barker, and Rizal Ayer, right? Who were key people. And what we did in the website is to actually cut snippets of it. Uh, so, you know, create a, a, a question and cut, you know, the, the questions so that we had little snippets of the interview, right? That runs throughout the whole website. So I invite all of you to have a look at the website, engage with it. If you, you're inspired and you want to write an article about it, come contact us, our contacts are there. And we are still looking for people to, you know, write and build into this from this fashion database. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. So now I'd like to invite all the um, speakers uh, to join me up front in one of these seats uh, so we can have a discussion. And thank you very much for everyone really sticking to time, more or less. So we've got a full half hour to discuss. So I'm going to sit at the end. Um. So thank you again, everyone, uh, for sharing little snippets of your research, and of course, Coach Yang, for the keynote setting up the NHB agenda. Uh, we will have time to take questions from the audience, um, so please do put up your hands later on, um, start thinking about your questions, and I'll be happy to call on you. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions, and uh, we'll also have an opportunity to expand a little bit on your very interesting projects. Um, obviously, five minutes doesn't really do it justice. So because we have a predominantly um, student audience and research is a the focus of the seminar, I wanted to start with a research-related question. Um, I think all of you outlined some of the challenges in your research, um, working with archival material. Um, as Masna said, you can't contact the people in those photographs. They're no longer living. You don't really know who took many of those photos, um, I believe. You just mentioned, Gina, that also um, it wasn't possible for you to contact any of the um, sources. Um, and of course, Kingmi, you're dealing with a lot of people on the ground. Um, so maybe could each of you say a little bit about how you dealt with these challenges? Because obviously that could create certain limitations of gaps in your research um, and how you overcame them. Thanks, Sunita. Okay, um, yes, I just want to pick up from Sunita's point about uh, photographs uh, that we looked at were a real mystery. First, you don't know who took the photographs. You don't even know the subject. You don't even know the year sometimes So because it's just very, you know, they'll just say, I mean, we have to, like postcards, we can kind of uh, look at this, the, the stamp. Uh, sometimes it's legible, sometimes it's not, you know, 19 O, and then you can't see, you know, the last uh, number. Um, yeah, so so the, the, the main question that I didn't have to, I, I didn't have a chance to um, explore with you earlier was, was the idea of women 
in history. So that was our main theme. So uh, women were really silent, you know, in in history because uh, either they were not really at the center of things, uh, because most of the histories that you know would be about ruling uh, states, ruling governments, people who were famous, Stanford Raffles, you know, do you know Stanford Raffles' wife? I mean, she is actually more well known, is it, than others, other of the wives. So the, looking at the photographs would, would be an opportunity to find out about them. But we, we found out that a lot of them were just nameless. And, and not only that, but the labeling of the photographs were really problematic. So you would have Malay woman, you know, they would say, but actually you, you look closer, she's actually Pranakan, she may be wearing a kabaya, right? She actually does look Malay sometimes. Uh, so we had to look, sort of look at clues, uh, say for example, the furniture that she, she's sitting on. So obviously it's not Malay. Uh, you look at the props around, not Malay, right? But everything else about her is Malay, you know, because she's wearing a sarong, you know, she's wearing the same uh, jewellery that you would find in a Malay woman. Okay, back to the question about the, uh, uh, well, the Queen, the concert of the uh, uh, Sultan of Bera at that time. This was in 1924. She didn't even have a name. So we looked at the archival record. There were some records about it. In fact, she was not allowed to have an audience with the King, King George at that time, because she was not of royal birth. So I mean, the British were really hierarchical. So only the Sultan, you know, was allowed to have an audience see, with the King. So how, how did we find out about her name? Well, actually, we found out about her name because there was a story about someone who died in the royal family. And this was, a, this was in 19 and 1960s, it came out in the newspaper, and we figured that it must be her because it was said that she was the concert of the previous sultan. And when we, kept, when we calculated the age, you know, it was about, she died at the age of 92. So those kind of things. But what I want to bring up is that uh, I said about her smiling and all that, so that was the part they wanted to bring up. Uh, so uh, when we look at her activities, she was very active. She was very much, she was like a very modern kind of woman, you see? A Malay woman, very modern. Uh, so so uh, we want to give her a voice. Okay, that, that's that's uh, one purpose. Uh, well, I think I'll stop there. There's so many others, you know, uh, examples. But I, I just want to emphasize again that if you are into photography, I think it's a medium that is so um, fantastic, I think. And, and, and it's, not, it's not that you don't really need to have a, a skill of interviewing, but you do need to have the skill of uh, perception, very uh, deep, you know, visualization. And also, as I say, you need to corroborate uh, the evidence by looking at other sources at the same time. So it, it's very, it, it's, I think, uh, forget about the, the photographs in your phone. I think even the photographs in, in your phone, <laughs> because you take hundreds of them, right? If you look at each one, each one will have a different uh, story. Yeah, okay. yeah uh, to sort of uh, try to engage, uh, to engage uh, <coughs> Sunita's question about the challenges I think, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, there was the language problem, there was the language issue, but there was also like, you know, different temples have different hierarchies, different, and we need to figure out who are the authority figures and who are the ones who know about which part of what, the festival, the ritual to the organization, and also, uh, so working out, working this out and working this through is one, is one of the challenges. And then the other one is like, uh, the the training of the students, as I mentioned. So we have to train them in the use of photographic equipment. I mean, we are not so lucky like here. You probably have designated training programs uh, and also uh, fieldwork training. So we needed to sort of brief them on what they needed to ask and how to deal with uh, various uh, fieldwork situations. And yeah, so, so, so the challenges are, are more or less uh, practical and yeah, so we, we tried our best to, so we, we, had a, we had a mixed group of like uh, graduate colleagues, uh, faculty and graduate students who in a sense were distributed throughout the teams to help uh, guide the students along and to go down when necessary. And you know, uh, yeah, so, but as I said, it's, it's, it involves a lot of persistence and usually when the students cannot maintain the persistence and we have to, come in, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah.
Can I just ask you, um, you mentioned when you were speaking about the 75% women demographic yes. and how the temples uh, don't allow women access to certain things or... Yeah. How did you overcome that? So I have to find the, the male members that we have <laughs> and then... You know, twenty-five percent. Yes, and then distribute one for each temple where necessary. But usually, I will, I will not. I will try to have students going to temples near where they live, right? So because of this, right, I might have to tell the male student, okay, sorry, Singkang, but you got to go Jurong East or Jurong West, <laughs> not something that is. Um, yeah. So we, we 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 also lose student members that way because, in a sense, the the distance. Yeah, yeah. But but we. We sometimes negotiate as well. Uh, we, we maybe we know that we, they cannot go too near. We give them a longer lens or something like that. Yeah. But even then, like, but interviews wise is usually okay. It's just the document, the sort of photo documentation, the video documentation. But yeah, so. Students being involved in research, yeah. I think it's not just uh, the training that they receive tr and the experience through the project but what where, where I sit for example we have seen like students coming to apply for NHB jobs and they're able to highlight you know, some of these projects that they've done the research that they've done in the CV and that, that really makes them stand out from from the crowd of um, applicants I think that's also important because it speaks of you know students that have uh, real experience on the ground working research interviewing um, real real you know, issues on the ground and that I think helps students stand out in the as well. Just wanted to add that point. Thank you, Kirk Siang. I think that's something for us to take note of here at La Salle for sure. Um, Gina. Um, so, how did, uh, just addressing the challenges, right? Um, okay, there, there's just a whole host of challenges that, that we face from the, from the outset. Um, basically, it, the project was really huge, and I think. Um, I would say that having a team was very, very helpful. So from, from the outset, it started as a team. But to be honest, my left and right hand team members both left within six months. Um, one, because they, one was a postdoc. So she wanted a full-time employment. She had just bought a house in Singapore, personal things, and she wanted to go for a full-time job that pays well. Um, so she left that. And the other one was a PhD student, right? So um, I was very, I think, Having teamwork is one, serendipity is the other thing, right? I think there's, you need a bit of luck in research. And I managed to find um, other members, um, one of whom used to work with Nadia here um, in, in fashion, and um, she was very committed to the project, right? Very committed to, to seeing it through. And I think having built up a team of hierarchies, so I had you know two under me, and then they had three under them, and you know to do this sort of research really helped to, to pull the project together. Otherwise, there was just so much database. Um, imagine like trawling through so many years of, of editorial um, newspapers and clippings. It was it was just you know that I think that the sheer amount of data that we have in Singapore was you know another thing of course is that working on the ground level with the students um, it just meant that the supervision was actually um, really fruitful because they would ask lots of questions. So it really helps you to kind of go back to your method methodology and how to actually create narrower, tighter methodologies that they can follow. Um, and that helped me to be a better leader as well. And it also helped them because it helped to clarify parameters for them, right? So I think it was there was a lot of synergy that way. You know? And I, I think um, all of them had something from the project. You know? So I think having that team and that, that personality aspect was very important right, for, for, the, for the project itself. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that needs to be highlighted is time. Um, your projects, because we often see the end result and we have very nice websites and um, for all three projects actually, um, but it was two years, 2016 to 2018 for Kingwee's project, yours was also a two year project. Um, of which I think you said the last six months was the working on the website. Um, and how long was your project? Uh, two, two, and a half two and a half years. So, so that's a lot of time spent with the archival material and really just gathering the data, analyzing the data, right? 
Um, and I think I want to pick up on one of the things that you mentioned just now, Gina, about adapting your research. So we see the finished product. Um, could you say, was it something that, um, did you have a very clear end result in mind? You knew that this is what your exhibition's going to look like. This is what kind of publication you're going to have. Um, what kind of, what you wanted the database to, to um, um, present. Or is this something that evolved with the project? Um, you had some maybe other specific ideas or maybe no ideas about what the output would look like. So maybe we can start with you, Gina. I'll be brief. Um, I had, um, we had the methodology because it's called archiving documentation. So we were very clear that this was going to be an archival project uh, in terms of the sources. But when we were looking at the sources, more and more and more sources came along. Then we realized that there's a huge, um, for example, Malay language con content, which no one in our group had expertise to do. Then there was a huge um, Chinese language one, again, which nobody had expertise. So these begin begin to be like limitations in the project and gaps that we've actually noted for future researchers but that we couldn't really deal with right so the second language press was actually is actually huge um so um yeah that that was i'm oh, sorry <laughs> yeah 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 so we had to so you recognize that that is something for further research and yes. that it's not going to be an obstacle, yes. but it's something that you encountered as you went along. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'll pick up on your point about the output, right? You, you were interested. Yeah, of course, uh, I finished, uh, the group has finished our project. So we're in, in the process of publishing okay, our result. Hopefully, you know, the book will come out soon. But I hope that whoever gets a chance to read the book later, will realize that uh, what we achieved was one, was to uh, show that, um, well, okay, one was to bring out, you see, the presence of women okay, in history. So that's very important. Because if you look at any uh, records, very few, you know, you, 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 I mean, you, you know, it's not easy to see what women did, say, about 100 years ago. Okay? And photograph is just probably one of the ways, you see, to see what was the situation. Now, number two, we wanted to actually show uh, how colonialism, colonialism was not just about some other group, you know, coming to govern <coughs> the local people. But, you know, the idea of subjugation and exploitation could actually uh, be manifested through images. So why, 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 why was there a subjugation there? So there's one group of photographs where the, when, when the camera was invented, it was almost like a tool for imperialism, where you see the colonial powers would go to all their colonies and take pictures of so-called the subjects, yeah, the natives, and then these were just not photographs to be kept personally. What happened in those days was that these photographs were then reproduced uh, into postcards. And postcards, you know, those days people didn't travel, right? Postcards was and an, uh, an invention that actually furthered, you see, the imperialistic domination. Because postcards were so popular uh, from the 19... Uh, well, it was invented about the 1890s uh, to the 1930s. <coughs> so uh, people say in uh, Liverpool, for example, they don't know what happened in the colonies, right? Because only a few people will be going there to govern the colonies. But through postcards, they got the vision, you see, of what it was like to be in colonies. But it was a very, very uh, skewed uh, image. So uh, the photographers would uh, uh, photograph women because they were considered you know, exotic. Right? A lot of the women were just like bare-breasted you know, because they were like native women you know, in Bali, in Sarawak, in Borneo. Uh, being bare-breasted was just part of the community because it was not sexual see, at that time. But when they, these images were reproduced into postcards, the women were objectified. And so uh, there were two things that happened. One is it kind of uh, uh, gave the impression that, oh, the natives were very uncivilized, you see? And that, you see, the mission of colonialism was uh, justified because they would be going there to modernize the people. So that, that was one of the outcomes, you see, of uh, photography and images see, at that time. Um, yeah, I'll stop that. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I just wanted to add on, I mean, or just to expand that. So when you made these uh, discoveries, I'm assuming that 
some of this were things that you already knew going in, you expected to find, and then was probably verified through your findings. So did it have an effect on how you you decided how to present, represent? Because there's already a kind of skewed lens for the original content. How did this inform your final output? Uh, I think that's a great question because we had a lot of uh, ethical and moral issues also because... Um, we, we, we had an uh, online exhibition, actually. Uh, unfortunately, you see, the site has been taken down because at the end of the project, we couldn't really kind of maintain you see, the website. Um, we had uh, issues like, should we uh, put up these photographs? Yeah, some women, some young women, you see, were actually, I think they were, well, we suspect that they were all paid. Uh, they would be photographs in the studios in Singapore. Singapore was a, was a major center you know, for uh, photography studios. Because it's very commercial and every so people, so so you have uh, pictures of these women uh, being taken and then they were reproduced in postcards. Of course, without their knowledge, and neither did they get anything out of it, right? Because you know you you, you don't you didn't even have a conception that these postcards would be traveling uh, around the world. So yeah, we had some issues. Should we uh, put up these photographs, right? Because then you are just um, adding on, is it, to the objectification of these women's bodies? Uh, at some point, we decided to kind of uh, uh, kind of blur the image, is it like the breast, you know, of the women? But then other people will say, "Why do you do that? Is it you're you're actually uh, imposing self censorship when actually you should just be taking, just showing, and then tell uh, what it's all about?" Well, okay, so we compromised. So before people actually entered the website, there was a disclaimer there which says that some of these photographs may be offensive but they were taken in a different period. And if you feel that you know you, 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 you can't take it, please don't enter the website. So you don't click, because if you click on the uh, enter button, that means you have consented to all uh, of, of the disclaimers see, that we put up. Uh, and so yeah, so in publishing also, I think uh, Muse published <laughs> one of my article. Uh, uh, there was an article, I think the latest uh, issue, you can read about the story, the subjugation of women, you see, through photographs. They also didn't actually uh, put the whole photograph there. They just had the women's uh, image you know, from the uh, top. Yeah. Uh, so, so is it you know this kind of thing? But then we want to show people. But that's what happened. Is it at that time? So yeah, those are the dilemmas I think uh, in this kind of research. Okay, thank you, Kaylee. Uh, yeah. So the question was. <laughs> Shall I repeat the question? It was about whether or not. Um, the, you had a very clear oh, yes. outcome, output in mind, okay. or did it evolve as the project okay. went on? Yeah, I think uh, it was, in terms of the outcome, right, the publication was clear. We had to do the publication, and then, uh, but we weren't sure whether we, were, we wanted to uh, do a, like for example, a website or a uh, documentary. So in the end, we did the website because we, we realized we needed some more time with the publication, so the website was where we posted things out. Because in a sense, when we did this project, it's uh, we are also answerable to the to the temples, because the temples will be asking us, "Oh, you've been here for two years. What's like, what what's what's happening?" You know. So so we decided to like uh, do the do a we did a website a website, and then we also did small albums, photos or photos we took. Uh, to uh, as a gift for them, right? Uh, to to yeah. Uh, while we were working on the publication, but in terms of the publication, uh, one some of the, many of the things we didn't envision. I mean, a lot of uh, we we had a. I think we already had a clear idea of what we wanted in terms of the, the the content, right? So we needed to feature all the fifteen temples. We cannot select. Uh, we just have to decide how to order the temples because it's also a very sensitive issue. And then we also uh, decided that there should be one volume that explains the background of the different practices and all that to sort of try to connect it back to older traditions. So I think the idea was there, but uh, execution was a different matter because like, in terms of, because we did a, we, we, we wanted from the start to do a bilingual uh, publication so that people in the temple could understand and we could reach a younger audience uh, who were more fluent in English. Uh, but the problem then was how do you translate various Chinese ritual terms into English right? and, and vice versa. So uh, there was a lot of 
pro there was a good, uh, relatively, uh, it was a difficult process. Right? So it was not easy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually have a couple of questions for Kutsiam, <coughs> but we have also reached the last five minutes. So I am going to look at the audience very quickly to see if anyone's got a question. Please, this is now your chance to ask. Natalia. Thank you so much for this really fascinating presentations. I enjoyed all of them. So my question is at some point dumb, but at another point <laughs> sophisticated. How each of you would define heritage? It seems like a simple question, but I'm now writing an encyclopedic entry about smart heritage, and I was like having a hard time, like what actually heritage is? So I, I really want to, because each of you look at different things, right? Festivals and fashion and the representation of women. So how you, for yourself, define heritage? Thank you. Do you want to kick that off? I can go first. Uh, I think broadly we, we, we look at heritage in various aspects. One aspect is what we call the, the tangible heritage, which is basically things that are physical in nature, like um, a physical building, uh, historic park spaces, uh, objects, uh, archaeology sites, uh, collections of museums, you know, things like that. And then there's the other part that we call the intangible cultural heritage, which is all about the oral traditions, uh, uh, performing arts, uh, festivals, festivals like uh, what not King Lee, the Nine Burgos Festival, uh, even food heritage, uh, and it, it in itself is, is very broad. Uh, I, I think at least these two areas guides us in our work, but behind all of them there's a lot of history, there's a lot of uh, knowledge of people, skills, even the a festival has people's stories, oral histories, uh, objects, so uh, while we, I say there's, there's two broad areas, they are very, very much interconnected. A uh, temple space, for example, has a building architecture that is also very uh, historic, but at the same time, the temple is a living space that has festivals, they have people, uh, they have um, religious rituals involved in it. Uh, so while I define that, it's, it's, it's very, very much interlinked. Thank you. Would anyone else like to offer your concept of what heritage is to you? Um, let me just kind of be oppositional here and say, you know, what is an heritage, right? Um, because I, I think like the, the word heritage can have a loaded meaning as well, right? Um, sometimes what we then deem to be heritage seems to be of particular symbolic significance to the nation, to particular cultures and so on. So what is not heritage then may be deemed unimportant, right? Um, so is heritage as well just particular histories, right? Histories that we can collect and histories that we can put together. So it does seem sometimes that the, the term heritage has particular ideological meanings, right? Just that's as far as we can move from Kirk Xiang's <laughs> reply, right? Which is, um, you know, quite um, what we're looking at, you know, in terms of the sorts of meaning, symbolic structures and things. And I think that on the ground level, I mean, there's also heritage from the ground up, what people deem as important, and sometimes what people don't realize is, that is important about their everyday lives. And I think, to me, that's the really interesting thing, is like what kind of everyday person acknowledges and maybe does not acknowledge and does not realize but it's actually a really key and important, you know, um, symbolic significance that may not may not have been um, labeled as heritage yet. So I think it's an expanding area, right? I think that um, young researchers here, we want to empower them, we want them to think about realizing that, you know, what is it about their everyday lives and cultures and practices that may have significance beyond just the everyday. Yeah. Can I just add on, because I, I, I missed out an important point, because sometimes when we look at heritage, it's all about the past, but it's not. It's, it's Yes, it's in the past, it's inherited, but it's also about the present, because we, we inherited a lot of the heritage, our practices, the knowledge, 
from from our forefathers, but it's also about the future, right? How what are the, what are, what are we leaving a legacy for for the next generation? How are cultural practices being transmitted from one generation to another? So, yeah, I just wanted to add that point. I feel it's quite important to highlight that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we actually have we've reached the end, but are we okay to take one more question, Natalia? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, Jeffrey. Yeah, so can you share some of the current <coughs> research on current cultures? Yeah. Is it possible to share some of the current research that's on the current cultures? You know, like just just branching out from what you just shared, because today's panel we've heard research projects of you know looking back. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what's the current, are there current projects looking at the now, here and now? Yeah, yeah, la, yes. Like, are there, are there research projects on the significance of TikTok? Are there uh, research projects on why young people are pro procrastinating? Uh, are there projects on... <laughs> yeah. I think Thank we'll reject uh, procrastination of yeah. young people as heritage. <laughs> but, but actually a lot of the, I can start with answering, actually a lot of the projects are about the current day. For example, King Wee's okay. project, it's, it's not about the past, it is a current day because it is a living heritage, there's a festival that's still being practiced. Um, there we, we, we do have other research projects, for example, we, we have funded, for example, a project to study uh, people's pre perceptions of uh, buildings, which what do they deem as important? So it's, it was a very interesting study because it's a current day people, the people like young people, what do they think as, as heritage? And interestingly, some of them will say, oh, Changi Airport Control Tower is a very historic for them because it's like a symbol of uh, Singapore because every time I land or take off, I see it, it's like a symbol or even Malayan has taken a, becoming a heritage symbol. Some people say that hey, the Malayan is a symbol of Singapore. It's like taken in photographs all over the place. So, but it was a very interesting study, but it's an example of like, we are looking at the now, the people's perceptions of the past. Uh, and we have many other of such projects. So it's always, a, there's always a contemporary take on some of these things. Even like when you find a very technical study, for example, uh, research into the materials used for the historic buildings, is to help us advise like us today, how do we better restore, conserve this building so that it can last another 50, hopefully even 100 years for the future generations. So we are looking for also applied research, how some of these research help guide our decision making, our, our, our work into the now and future as well. Thanks. I think that's a very good note to end on. So thank you very much to all the panelists and to Kirk Thiong for for sharing the research agenda of NHB and being the keynote. Um, let's give them a round of applause. And today is the last day of our research seminar, so I'd like to um, ask Natalia to come up and say the final closing words. Thank you, Sunita, and thank you all panelists and Kaksian for being here. And I just feel that this conversation should continue for another hour. <laughs> I just feel like I'm getting even more hungry for this kind of conversation and learning more from you. So thank you for sharing your perspectives. I'm still confused about heritage is and where we should derive boundary. Was it, this is heritage and this is no longer heritage. I, I think there is no boundary like that. So it's, it's, it's really so big and broad. So, and thank you for sharing some exciting things about your research project that I actually didn't know, uh, especially about the involving of students. I think this is one of the most important parts that I got very excited and I have amazing ideas of putting up a research grant involving our students into our heritage um, our research. So thank you for being here and thank you for all our audiences for being with us for the last six weeks where we explored different research projects happening in Singapore. So this is the end of this seminar series, but get excited for the new one that is coming up next semester. And our new topic will be on post-human society. <laughs> so get excited, come and join us next semester. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.